In 1939, the Jewish population of Europe stood at over 9 million. By the end of 1945, that number had been ground down to a little over 3 million. Between those years, 6 million Jews were systematically exterminated by Adolf Hitler's Nazi government. Two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population. 6 million. That's equivalent to 2,302 9-11s. Imagine a 9-11 happening every single day for over six years. There are few tragedies in human history that rival the magnitude and moral bankruptcy of what later became known as the Holocaust. This is Earth's most infamous genocide. The question of how the Holocaust happened, how a nation of seeming nobility could descend into such widespread depravity, is one that will likely be asked for generations to come, perhaps without ever achieving an answer. One place to begin an understanding is Germany's 1933 elections. Hitler and his Nazi party approached the 1933 elections as radical outsiders to the country's established government class. Feelings of German inferiority were subverted into concepts of Germans as the master race. And for the nation's economic depression, he found a scapegoat, Jews. European anti-Semitism was nothing new, and perceptions of Jews as conniving threats were deeply rooted. Such racist stereotypes were inflamed by Hitler in the lead up to his election, and he won. In the years following Hitler's election victory, Nazi anti-Jewish propaganda was disseminated relentlessly, inciting hatred against the nation's Jews and ultimately fostering a climate of indifference to their fate. And then, in 1941, the Nazi party began implementing a policy referred to as the final solution. What initially began as shooting operations that claimed the lives of more than 1.5 million Jews morphed into something terrifying in its cold efficiency. Gas chambers, concrete bunker-like buildings designed to emit the deadly Zyklon B gas through its ceiling were stationed in extermination camps. These camps, Majdanek, Treblinka, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and more, were situated in occupied Poland and housed nearly three million Jews deported from Nazi-controlled countries between 1941 and 1945. At Auschwitz-Birkenau, during the height of these deportations, an average of 6,000 Jews were gassed to death each day. In early 1945, Allied forces moved across Europe in a series of offensives against Germany. And in doing so, they began to encounter and liberate concentration camp prisoners. That was around only 75 years ago. For the few European Jews who survived the Holocaust, little awaited them on the other side. Many were liberated to the recognition that they were the last of their family alive. Yet rather than lying on the floor and crying, European Jews stood up and began to rebuild. For the Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, Nazi hate taught the invaluable need for goodness and kindness. As time drifts away from those events, Far less reliable is humanity's response and its sense of mutual responsibility. Mounting Holocaust denial and swelling anti-Semitism seems to be dragging us further and further away from shared humanity and compassion. In the hearts of their offspring, survivors imbued love and acceptance. Instead of bitterness, survivors preached compassion and this positivity defined the Jewish recovery. The Nazis hoped the Jewish story would end in the death camps, 
Instead, survivors chose to continue the narrative. The antidote to Hitler's attempts to annihilate the Jewish people is to build a more committed and prolific Jewish world. A world shining in self-pride. And this is what's been done. If the Holocaust is one of history's most shameful events, the Jewish response is one of its greatest triumphs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And on behalf of the Forsyth County Schools, our synagogue, Congregation Beth Israel, and our umbrella Jewish organization, Chabad of Forsyth, Dawson, and Lumpkin Counties, it is my great honor and privilege to welcome you all to this evening's A Historic Evening with Eva Schloss and Dr. Edith Eager. Tonight's event is two years in the making and we have scheduled and rescheduled through COVID lockdowns and illness, and we still do not give up on tonight's very important event. Thank God we're here together tonight. Uh, this is a true testament to the commitment and respect that we have for our people, our history, and our unwavering resolve to bring our community together in unity and hope. Uh, first and foremost, before we begin tonight's program, I want to thank our Forsyth County School System for partnering with us uh, to bring tonight's event to our community. In particular, I want to thank our Forsyth County Superintendent, uh, Dr. Jeff Bearden, and Director of Communications and Community Engagement of Forsyth County Schools, uh, Jennifer Caracciolo. Thank you very much. You know, Jennifer, it's been a real pleasure coordinating tonight's event with you and definitely looking forward to working together in the near future. I also would like to thank, you know, it's been two years in the making for tonight's event. We don't take it for granted. And um, I would like to thank Mr. Bill Fielder uh, for getting this event off the ground two years ago and making tonight's community-wide program possible. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. I also would like to thank our signature sponsors. Again, two years in the making. Uh, thank you for holding on. We're here tonight. We'd like to thank Dr. Scott and Molly Cooper. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Northside Hospital, uh, Lynn Jackson. Thank you very much. And thank you to Central EMS, Gary Coker. Thank you very much. I also would like to recognize and welcome all of our host groups that are joining us this evening, whether in person or the thousands that are together with us via Zoom. I would like to thank and recognize all of the groups that have come together uh, from the members of Congregation Beth Israel, the Forsyth County High School, Forsyth Herald, Dr. Joel Hoffman, Sheriff Ron Freeman, Bill Fielder, the Himalayan Children's Charity, Forsyth County Fire Department, the Seniors of Forsyth County, the Forsyth Chamber of Commerce, Todd Levent, and Northside Forsyth. With that being said, our sages have taught that action is the main thing. And of course, tonight we will begin hearing unbelievable stories that will stir us, that will inspire us and change the way we may think, the way we may feel about certain things. But our sages have taught that action is always the main thing. And therefore, as an introduction tonight to tonight's evening, as we t unite together as a community to learn and to be inspired, it is my honor to first call upon our Forsyth County Superintendent, Dr. Jeff Bearden, to share with all of us a future initiative for the new school year of 2022-2023. Good evening, everybody, and welcome for those of you who are here face-to-face -face and those of us joining online. <clears throat> this school year, Forsyth County Schools launched a fantastic partnership with Congregation Beth Israel. Last fall, <clears throat> we held the inaugural planting of 500 daffodils for the Daffodil Project, a worldwide living Holocaust memorial to recognize the 1.5 million children who perished in the Holocaust. You may have seen the daffodils blooming when you walked into Focal this evening. 
Tonight is our second event, and we're all very excited to be here. An evening with Holocaust survivors, Eva Schloth and Dr. Edith Eager, Edith Eager. As of 2022, it is estimated that only 400,000 Jews who survived or fled the Nazis and their collaborators from 1933 through 1945 are alive worldwide. This is a great opportunity for all of us. Next year, as the rabbi mentioned, we will be expanding the partnership to include two new opportunities. The first is called the ARC 180 Project. ARC stands for Acts of Random Kindness, which encourages students and staff to perform a daily act of kindness. All school classrooms will be provided one yellow ARC bank, every school classroom in Forsyth County, one yellow ARC bank, representing that we are all, all selling in the same direction. We will collect donations for each routine kindness act. The goal is to turn kindness into a daily habit and change the lives of both the person giving and receiving, therefore improving our world with positive and consistent action and inspiring hope. Any funds collected may be donated by the classroom or school to a nonprofit of their choice. ARCs will be distributed to all of our schools in July. Forsyth County Schools will feature four schools, acts of routine kindness per month on social media using the hashtag ARC180Project. The second event will be in the spring of 2023, featuring music of the Holocaust here at the Focal Center. For many victims of Nazi brutality, music was an important means of preserving and asserting their humanity. Such music also serves as a form of historical documentation. Forsyth County Schools is committed to teaching our students, our staff and families about the Holocaust and honoring its survivors and victims. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Dr. Bearden. It is with great disappointment to share with you all a text message which I received early this morning uh, that sadly, uh, Mrs. Eva Schloss was rushed to the hospital last night and her daughters shared with me that she felt that she almost passed, that her soul almost left her body last night to the extent that she gathered her family to surround her with her final wishes as she felt that her life was almost coming to an end. Of course, with that happening, sadly, she won't be able to be together with us this evening. I couldn't believe it. About three hours ago, I got a text from her daughter, and she says, you're not going to believe, but my mother doesn't stop talking about the community in Forsyth County, Georgia. She says that she wants to get on a Zoom right now. I texted the mother and I said, the events this evening, there's no one that's gonna be able to get onto the Zoom. She says, you don't understand all my mother has been talking about since the beginning of the pandemic, that she wants to connect with the Forsyth County community. Could you imagine such a woman and such integrity? I told her, I said, what do you want me to do? So the daughter says, listen, She's 93 years old. The doctors have already diagnosed her with a disease on her brain. I don't know how much longer she has on, in this world. Log on to Zoom, have a 10 minute conversation. I did. I had a 10 minute conversation this afternoon with Mrs. Eva Schloss. I was able to ask three questions, questions that are powerful, penetrate the heart, and it was quite moving to hear the responses that Mrs. Eva Schloss, a few hours after thinking her life was going to be coming to an end, yet again, at age 93, what she shared with me, and God willing, after tonight's event, I look forward to sharing through the Forsyth County School System the recording of that conversation with everyone. But if I may ask, that Eva's Hebrew name is Chava, and if we can please take a moment for a silent prayer for Eva, that she should be blessed with a complete and speedy recovery. It is our great fortune this evening to be able to have tonight's highlighted presentation with the remarkable Dr. Edith Eager. 
Dr. Edith Eva Eager published her New York Times best-selling memoir, The Choice, at the age of 90 in 2017. In 2022, during COVID lockdowns at the age of 93, she published her internationally best-selling guidebook, The Gift. Both books are translated into more than 30 languages. She is a survivor of Auschwitz, is a practicing and world-renowned psychologist, a great grandmother to seven, and the embodiment of lighthearted love, positive energy. Dr. Eager speaks to audiences internationally and maintains a practice in La Jolla, California. And it is my great honor to introduce tonight's moderator, the Director of Communications and Community Engagement of Forsyth County Schools, Jennifer Caracillo, and Dr. Edith Eager. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Eager. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cratchlow. I work for Forsyth County Schools. I am humbled to have the, have the opportunity to interview you tonight and also to have you join our Forsyth County community. I can remember reading your first book and I can also remember watching you on Oprah. So I guess whenever you do your bio, you could say interviewed by Oprah, Katie Couric, Larry King, and Jennifer Cratchlow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's an honor to have you here with us. We are a suburb of Atlanta, and we are one of the fastest growing communities in the nation. And so we've really made a commitment to educating not only our students and our staff, but also to educating our community. So we will have a recording of this interview on our YouTube channel later for our students and our teachers to use throughout the year in their classrooms. So are you ready to begin? Thank you. At the age of 16, in Hungary, you were a ballerina and a gymnast. I was a ballerina growing up. In fact, you actually trained for the Olympics, which is amazing. Could you share with us what your teenage years were like prior to the Nazis? Can you share what your teenage years were like prior to the Nazis? Well, my teenage years were very turbulent. I remember my 16th birthday that my boyfriend brought me 16 red roses. The boyfriend that I planned to go with to Palestine, the boyfriend who belonged to the Batar, and we were going to go to Palestine, and we were going to fight and fight and fight. And so my teenage years were really not experienced as I was planning. But you know, my boyfriend told me I had beautiful eyes and beautiful hands, and that really kept me alive, hoping that we're gonna see each other again. And that didn't happen, Hitler had other ideas. And I also must mention that never in the history of mankind, such a scientific and systematic annihilation of people existed. So it's not comparable to anything. And it's the final solution of white men when they decided they can celebrate that they can put 30,000 Jews in a oven in one day. So I am part of that, that teenage years when I learned how not to be just for me and me and how to communicate with one another and how to form a human family and how we were able to recognize that all we had was each other there. And of course, all we have is each other now. I understand that I'm talking to the audience today who have been experienced prejudice, and I would be more than happy to add my commentary on that. And uh, what is being held within us and how we are able to do something about prejudice, which is called pre-judge. We're not born with that, 
We are not born with hate. We are born with joy and most of all passion for life. I love your message for kindness and that you share that it actually started with your mother. So whenever in 1940, you share the story about how men from your village were taken to labor camps and your father was actually one of those individuals and he was lucky enough to return home to you. However, right after that, you were forced to wear a yellow star. You mentioned in your book about hiding your yellow star. Can you please share with us, as a 16-year-old child, what did it feel like to be given the star and to wear the star? Your experience with the yellow star and trying to hide it and what that was like as a 16-year-old as a young yes. person. And my boyfriend and I were hiding our yellow star. We would sneak into the movies after it started and we showed up very, very little in public, but we were very committed. We were very committed to Zion it and see to it that we're going to have a purpose and meaning by going to Palestine, and that was our dream. And that's all I know, how we were able to hold each other with uh, hopes and dreams that they would never, never give up. And that's why I am such a proud Jewish woman, because never in the history of mankind, as I told you, how what happened to our, to our um, ancestors who were slaves, and then after they were on the desert and were walking more than 40 years, but they never gave up. And I carry that blood, and I am very proud to tell you that I'm a woman of strength and I'm going to tell you I have no time to be a victim. It's not who I am, it's not my identity, it's what was done to me. That's a very great message to, regardless of what age you are or what you're going through, the message of hope and that it's up to you and the power that you have. Yes. So you also share within your book what it was like whenever you were 16 years old. And I could just imagine this whenever I was a 16 year old to just be woken up in the morning and being ripped out of my home with my family and being shoved into a train like cattle. And then you were forced in a brick factory with 2000 other Jews for a month. And then you and your sister and your mother were taken to Auschwitz. What was the advice that your mother gave to you the last time you saw her? Your mother's message in the train car. She. My mother was a very sensitive woman. I spent a lot of time with her alone because my father was playing billiards and such. But in the cattle car, she was sitting alone and then I joined her, and this is what she said. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that is exactly what happened. We were stripped of everything. My mother was pointed to the left and my sister and I to the right. And when I followed my mother, this guy comes and looks at me and looks at the beautiful dress that my father made me with two white little things that he was watching over. And then he told me, your mother is gonna just take a shower. And she threw, he threw me on the other side which meant right. This is the last time I've seen my mother. So your mother goes one way, you and your sister go the other way, and you're told your mother is going to get a shower. Later on you ask, where is my mother? And what did you see in the distance? What did the guard tell you? Um, when you asked about your mother, 
and the when, when we were thrown into the other side uh, for women, I met the couple. These were people who were there earlier and part of the final solution uh, that was in 1944. And they were people who were there in 1941. And of course, they somehow many times just took their anger out on us. So, so I remember that she pulled out my earrings and I was bleeding and I said, you know, I would have given it to you. And by the way, when will I see my mother? So she pointed at the chimney, fire was coming out and she said to me, I'm gonna give you a read of what she said. Your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. And my sister Magda hugged me and she said, the spirit never dies. And that really was the most beautiful way that I could enter that air of shreds when my sister told me that the spirit never dies. So your first day that you and your sister are at the camp, you lose not only your mother, but your father. You're stripped naked, you were shaved, you were all alone. And then the angel of death forces you to dance for him. Can you share what that experience was like after being ripped from your home, losing your mother and your father, and then being asked to perform? Dancing for Mangala in the barracks. And you know, he came to the barracks and he wanted to be entertained. And I was the one who was the always called upon when the president came to our hometown to do my dancing, you know, my Hungarian routine. And uh, so the girls just threw me in front of him. And my teacher was also there from my Jewish school. And I, I remember shaking the finger that that finger, and she told me, do as I told you, go. Yeah. And so I found myself, Dr. Mangala says, dance for me. So it goes when back I to- was with Dr. Franco, he said that when he was tortured, he closed his eyes and imagined that he is in a lecture hall lecturing about the psychology of the concentration camp. And I said, I too closed my eyes and the music was Tchaikovsky and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera. And that's the first thing I did when I traveled to Budapest a few years ago with Philip Zimbardo. I wanted to go to the opera house. Imagine that I was there with Boris Dakov dancing the Romeo and Juliet. Well, I did see Boris Dakov in Australia. My sister took me there to the beautiful uh, place where I was uh, admiring wonderful Boris Dakov. So at that moment, you thought back to what your mother told you with your mind and that they can't take that away from you and that is your power and that is your strength. But yes, I can't imagine. To, to respond or react because he gave me a piece of bread. And of course, immediately I wanted to eat it up. But then I realized that I had my sister and five other girls up there on the third place. So thank God I didn't need it. I shared it with my friends and my sister. And that was a good thing that I've done because I survived what is called the death march from Mauthausen to Gunzkirchen. And when I began to stop, 
what happened when you stop, you were shot and thrown into this gutter, which I revisited. But the girls that I shared the bread with, they came and they carried me, so I won't die. I really want to say that the worst thing can bring out the best in us. And so you share in your book that you were given a loaf of bread as a reward for your performance. And then you also talked earlier, just previously, about your sister and your five friends and how those relationships helped you. And so there you were, and what did you do? You shared your bread with others. I loved that. And then later, do you wanna talk about how that one act of kindness came back and actually helped to save your life? So tell again about the death march. I, I want to believe that somehow the loving God had a plan for me so I can guide people today from darkness to light, from victim to survivor, to be able to uh, be more flexible rather than rigid. And uh, I know that I don't do my work, I follow my calling. And now I never will ever retire. I'm gonna retire, retirement. So I don't care about the chronological age. Because when I was 40, my supervisor asked me to get a PhD. And I told him that it's impossible because by the time I get a PhD, I'll be at least 50. And he told me, you'll be 50 anyway. And so I'm hoping that today, if you are listening to me, go back to school, pick up another piece of paper, or you may just go and take belly dancing or do something, something that you never did before. You know, that's why I ask people, don't call me shrink, call me stretch. And I want people to stretch their comfort zone. And so Auschwitz, we never knew four o'clock in the morning, where are we gonna end up, where are we going? Just like now, we don't know that. I also didn't know whether I take a shower and instead of water, gas is going to come. So, you know, we always had this, this doubt. What's going to happen next? Where are we going? Are we going to really make it alive here? Because we were told every day that we're never going to get out of here alive. The only way I will get out of here is a corpse. I heard it, I heard it every day. And I decided that they were the prisoners, not me. So you see, I think it took a good brain to be able to make it happen. But I could do, because I couldn't touch the guard, I would have been shot. I couldn't touch the board wires, I would have been electrocuted, and how we learn to cooperate rather than compete or dominate. So one thing I thought was interesting when reading your book is that you do not have a tattoo on your arm like many Holocaust survivors and Holocaust victims did have. And you were told that you were going, you were not going to live very long, so they didn't want to tattoo you. So what was that like knowing that every day this may be your last day and that you don't have the same markings that everyone else does? What was it like that they didn't want to waste the ink on you, as they said? That's right. Yeah, I, that like? I stood in line to get my tattoo and uh, I didn't get it. I said, why don't you give me my tattoo? And I was told, they don't want to waste the ink with you because you're going to go to the gas chamber. And there we were separated pretty soon. I saw Magda 
being on another pile, and I knew I had to do something. So I wanted to get the attention of the warden. So I started to do cartwheels so he could he could jump over and then we were put on the top of a train uh, with uh, uniforms, thinking that the British won bomb and we were carrying yes. ammunition on the top of the train. So throughout your imprisonment, you spent time at various death camps. Could you share what the conditions were like and if there was a typical day? What were the conditions of these camps? Was there a day that was typical from day to day? In the evening, we got a little piece of bread, which was kind of like a sawdust with a soup that was filled with medication. I never cried in Auschwitz. I never shed a tear in Auschwitz. And so a typical day was when we didn't know whether I'm going to make it this day or not. But my curiosity kept me alive. I think my curiosity was really a wonderful asset that I always wanted to know what's going to happen next. I especially do that with women who are looking for a good man. <laughs> and they're going to find this man, right? The perfect man. But then he comes and goes. And then I use the word next. <laughs> that you're not revolving, but evolving. So we talked earlier about the death march and how it went on for days and days. And then you had your friends that you had shared your bread with earlier assist you because you were ill, your back was broken. So you walk up those final steps for the death march. And remember, you get to the top, you get turned one way instead of the other way. Thus, you survived. What was that feeling? Take us back to that moment whenever you've done this long march, you've hiked up the steps, being carried by others, and all of a sudden, you're turned the other way. What was it like when you actually arrived at Gunskirchen and you actually had made it? I made Gunskirchen and that was in April 1945 to discover that there was cannibalism, that people were eating other people's flesh. They were eating on a dead horse. It was terrible and terrible and terrible. And thank God I met one of the survivors who was there liberating me. Alan Muskin is his name. And he told me about the camp, how terrible it was. So when cannibalism broke out, if you see the sound of music, you're going to see a beautiful place. That's where I was in that kind of a, uh, environment. And I remember talking to my God, asking for what to do, because I will not touch human flesh. And I was ordered to just look down, and I still had grass to eat. So I can't, it's not in my vocabulary. I run into a classroom, I put on the board, I can't, and then I erase the apostrophe and the T. Yes, I can, yes, I am, yes, I will. A lot of B, B for something rather than against something. And I remember choosing one blade of grass over and against the other. So I can't, is not in my vocabulary. 
And that's a wonderful message. Whenever you look out and you see a field of grass and how many blades that there's actually of grass out there, while others were turning to cannibalism to survive, you were turning to blades of grass. And it reminds me of what your mother kept, what your mother told you whenever you saw her last. They can't take it away from you. You have the strength, you can keep going. And so when you were liberated in 1945, you were left for dead. So I would like everyone that's listening or watching to imagine piles and piles of bodies. And underneath it is Eva, it, underneath it is Edith, sorry. A military man, a military gentleman from the United States, a soldier, comes in to do a rescue mission. And all he sees are stacks and stacks of bodies. But underneath it, Edith's hand starts to move. So the soldier quickly thought, caught, sought medical attention and saved your life. You were 70 pounds at that time. You had a broken back, typhoid fever, and pneumonia. Do you remember that day? Do you remember the day you were liberated? I was liberated May 4th, 1945. It is documented in the Red Cross. It was a Friday afternoon, and I was told it was a Friday afternoon when I felt someone touching my hand, and then I looked up, and I saw a big lip, and oh, I was with Oprah, and she jumped up and she said, he was black. <laughs> yes, he was a man of color. His eyes had tears in it, and his hands had m and so if you come to my house, someone had M&M's made with my picture on it. You can get M&M's with my picture on it. And I'm being called grandma and great grandma. And, and I love to get older and wiser. And I'm hoping that I can be useful. I never ask people, how can I help you? But I do ask, how can I be useful to you? How, how can you find the Hitler in you? Because we're not born to hate. We learn it. We learn it. We're born to have joy. We were born to have love. And as I said, passion for life. And then your boyfriend, that kept you going all of those days, did he not pass the day before liberation? Eric, yeah, what happened? Eric and I were Zionists. We belonged to the Batal, and we were gonna go to Palestine and fight. We were very militant and very serious Zionists. And that never happened. He was killed the day before liberation. But you know, that kept me alive when I asked people, tell me about my hands, tell me about my eyes, because I wanted to be sure that I'm going to show up for, for him. Her Hungarian name was Imre. Imre, I call it here Eric uh, Friedman was his name. He was much taller than I was. I was kind of petite and skinny. Skinny, so I suffered less from hunger. So I ate my soup and I saved my bread. And then the following day, I told Magda that um, I'm really not hungry at all. I could share my bread with Magda because all we had was each other there, and you know what? All we have is each other now. And there I is prejudice practiced, not just in the South, in America, 
<laughs> you know, and I don't like labels of any kind, but I want people to recognize that young people tell me all the time that God doesn't make junk. And I like that, that you're here for a purpose, that you're moving forward, you pick an arrow, that you follow, that you have a goal, and you pay attention what you focus on, that will get you closer to the goal. And I sure like the idea of evolving rather than revolving. So after you were liberated, you and your sister found each other, and then you united with your third sister, correct? Oh, Clara was already in the camp when her Christian professor smuggled her out and hit her. And when I was on the top of a train going from Vienna to Prague, and when I got off the train, and on the street there was a big sign of my sister with her violin that she's giving a concert playing her famous Mendelssohn violin concerto. And that's how I found out that Clara was alive. She was saved by a beautiful man. And the name is Waldbauer, and he had a quartet and traveled all over the world. And I'm very, very grateful, so grateful that my sister Clara was not in Auschwitz because she was an artist. You know, she would have probably touched the guards or run into the barbed wire. You know, she wouldn't have made it. She was very temperamental, you know, very much of an artist. And that didn't work in Auschwitz. We had to learn very quickly to be able to live with hope and do the best you can with our very limited capacity. And while you were recovering, you also met the love of your life, also a Jewish, sur Jewish survivor, Bella. Am I saying his name correctly? Bella. Bella. So people, people ask me, did you love Bella? And this is my answer. I was 17 years old. I was very skinny. I was very lonely. But most of all, I was very hungry. And he bought me Hungarian salami. And that's how I got it from. Love didn't enter into it. I just hopefully wanted to belong again. And thank God we did get married. And thank God I did get pregnant. And the doctor told me that he's scheduling an abortion because I'm not strong enough. But I'm a survivor, you know, so I got up. I looked at the doctor and I said, sir, you watch when I say sir. You know, I'm going to say something. And I said, sir. I want to give life good night. And my late husband followed the doctor, apologizing that his young wife doesn't know how to talk to the doctor respectfully. So, so much for patriarchy in 1946 and 47, yes. Yeah. Well, thank God, my little girl, became five, nine and a half. She's a beautiful, brilliant psychologist. Her office is in New York. And she married someone who got a Nobel Prize in economics. So I tell you one thing, if you are a child of a survivor, the good question to ask, when did my childhood end? Because a child, takes care of the parents when you're immigrant. I never had uh, many things to eat, like tuna fish or peanut butter. I never saw anything like that. And most of all, my daughter taught me how to speak English. She got a book in the daycare center, and, uh, and 
the sky is falling. And there came luck, Ducky Lucky, Goosey Lucy, Turkey Lucky, and I didn't know Turkey from Lucky, Ducky nothing. So the child teaches you how to speak English, and then they tell you what to do. She's still telling me what to do. But now I know that um, I am a person in my own right, and I don't run from the past anymore. I don't live in denial or delusion or even not minimize anything what happened. I am much more of a listener now, compassionately listening. And I think that's the most important thing that I learned how to talk less and listen more. And that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. So that's important too. Are you the first born child? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Are you the first born child? Yes. Are you? Yes. Yes, if ma'am. You, if, if you marry a first born, you have two bosses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would do. So, yes. Uh, middle children are peacemakers. And the young people we call charming manipulators. <laughs> Here you look at one. I was a good brother when my parents really wanted a son and I came along. So you just talked about moving to America. Um, you moved in 1949, you and your husband and one child. And then you had two more children. And through that experience, you kept quiet. And you eventually, I believe at the age of 40, earned your PhD in clinical psychology. Talk to us about finding your voice. Talk to us about finding your voice. I was speaking at the University of Texas, and I did a lot of work with battered wives. And then the professor said that I also was in Auschwitz. And how many of you heard of Auschwitz? Maybe four hands went up with a big class, over 100, and I decided it's my job to let people know what happens. What happens when people get brainwashed and scapegoated and being told that we are cancer to society? And then I began to say to myself that I owe it to my parents. So they didn't die in vain. And yes, I speak now wherever I go, when I go to all over the country, all over the world, I let people know how we can prevent anything like that to happen again. That's my dream. And then you even made the journey back to the camp. Yes. I, I, I thought I needed to go back to that place, the lion, and to look at the lion in the face, but not only that, to reclaim my innocence and begin to forgive myself that I survived. I was filled with survivor's guilt. I never showed up for my graduation, even though I graduated cum laude. So to me, it was very important. I went to my sister. My sister turned to be a 100, January 23rd. And guess what she said? She's 99. I don't know why one year makes a difference, but Hungarian women can lie about their age. I don't, I don't, I, I, I never cut anything. I like my age. In fact, I get older and wiser, not old and senile. So I'm hoping that uh, this time today, people may recognize there is no going back 
there is a new beginning, that you may be pregnant and you want to give birth to the you, your genuine self, not the ego. That's why we call it the false self. You know, I tell people, uh, I'm a human being. I've done things that I could have done much better. I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. And I think that's a good idea because it takes courage to be average. And that led to your book, which you wrote, your first book, that you wrote at the age of 90. So I guess there's still hope for all of us here if we want to write our book. And you named your first book, The Choice. Tell us about choosing that name and choosing to be a survivor as compared to a victim. Tell about choosing the choice as the name and about choosing to be a survivor rather than a victim. It took a long time to think about what would really be the best thing I can give people because the more choices you have, the less you feel like a victim. And so that's how the choice came. And then people said, we want something practical. The choice is more about my life and so on. But that's how the second book is more practical. You read a page and you read another page and then you do the little homework and so I am now with my daughter writing recipes and that's going to be added to the to the gift in me on Mother's Day hopefully so I I am still in the process of becoming I have yet to stop and I am still climbing the mountain and sleeping climb I never stop climbing. I'm curious. I spoke to the Ukrainians. I am understanding how many people I spoke to. A hundred, over a hundred thousand have viewed the videos. Over a hundred thousand to give them hope and not to ever give up. And, and, and I see them. I see them when I know that may never will see their parents or they may never see their children. That, that they are totally separated and it's a hard, hard time. It's very sad what is going on and I, I stand up and talk as much as I can not to ever give up. And watching what's happening in Ukraine has to be very difficult too for you and your family and your children and your grandchildren that they're seeing firsthand what you lived through. It is very difficult. But who told you that life is easy? Did you look at your birth certificate? Does it say there is a guarantee? There is not. There is a probability that the way I think can change my body chemistry, that I can still say yes and rather than yes but. So give me the but, I give you an and, yes and, furthermore, that there is hope, there is a light. It's kind of being in a tunnel, can't go above it or under it, you got to go through it. You know, my precious uh, right hand person, Katie, today is the day when her husband died a year ago. And we're hoping to celebrate his life as many years that he was able to be a father to their beautiful two daughters and that we work together and empower each other that many times I turn to her and sometimes I tell her to shut up and listen to her children. <laughs> And she tells me to shut up and listen to my children. So that's the way it goes, you know. We exchange philosophies 
and uh, hopefully, hopefully that we'll find peace. It doesn't look that way now, but I will never give up hope. In your, in your book, The Gift, you ask the question, would you be married to you? Which is very interesting because a lot of times people ask, should I be married to this person? Should I marry that person? Should I be with them? Should I be at this job? But should I be married? Would I be married to me? That self-reflection that goes again back to the words from your mother about strength in yourself. I love that part of the book. Um, before we go to some short Q&A, I wanted to end with a quote from you. We're born to love, we learn to hate. It's up to us what we reach for. So we have some questions that were submitted in advance and we have also some from this evening. The first question is, why did you choose America as your home? The first question is, why did you choose America as your home? Oh my God. <laughs> well, you know, when the communists took over Czechoslovakia, they confiscated my husband's business and he called them Nazis, so they packed him up and put him in jail. I'm a survivor. I don't say why me. I say what now. I ran home. I picked up my big diamond ring. I put this in my little girl's diaper. I went to the jail. I, I took my husband. I gave the warden the, the, the diamond ring and so on. And then we ended up in Vienna. There was a letter from the American consulate that people who experienced the Holocaust can, and were registered can come to America. And we already packed up a whole cattle car with furniture, with a factory that my husband was going to open up in Israel. And then, then came the choice because my beautiful friend from Israel told me not to come to Israel because they're living in the desert in tents. And if I have a choice to go to America, and, and that's what I told my husband, we were supposed to meet the train where our belonging, everything was. And I told my husband, if you want to go to Israel, I don't want to keep you. I am going to America with Marianne. So he went to the train station. He heard his name being called. He was hiding and came back. And that's how I came to America in 1949. And what is your favorite game show? What's your favorite game show? I am addicted to Jeopardy. <laughs> and when I know the answer, yesterday I did the answer, sometimes I know nothing. Like American sports, nothing. But one night was Emil Zola, and I knew the answer, and they didn't. <laughs> so that's how it goes. But I'm totally addicted to my Jeopardy, and I tell people not to call me 7.30. I'm watching Jeopardy. You marched with Martin Luther King Jr. in Washington, D.C. What was that experience like for you to march with another great leader in our nation's capital. Marching with MLK in 1963, what was that like? 
Well, you see, when I worked in a factory in 1949, I went to the bathroom. I worked very fast, you know. I was cutting the boxer shorts, and I got seven cents per dozen. But when I went to the bathroom, one of them said, call it. And so I joined the women of color. And I joined the NASP. And I marched with Martin Luther King. And I sang with the mamas and the papas. I was told that one of them is still alive, Peter. It was Peter, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah. And uh, so that's what happened, that uh, I really wanted to do everything in my power for, for people to find the Hitler in themselves, but they can find Mother Teresa too, and goodness and kindness. And the more choices we have, the less we ever gonna feel like a victim. So I have two more questions. What life lessons did you learn during the pandemic? What life lesson did you learn during the pandemic? I learned to be a woman of strength, to look at life from inside out, to not wait for anybody to make me happy, to be my own person, to take charge of my thinking, my feeling, and of course, my behavior. Positive thinking means nothing unless it's followed with a positive action. So many times when I speak to teenagers and I'm giving them some suggestions and they tell me it's a good idea and I'm gonna do it. And I call them gonna people. They always gonna, always gonna <laughs> like Scarlett O'Hara. You know, I think about it tomorrow. I think about it tomorrow. So if you are a perfectionist, you want to be sure that you're not a procrastinator. And finally, what is your message to today's young people? What's your message to today's young people? You are the future. You are the ambassadors for peace and goodwill. I'm counting on you. And you're gonna continue doing everything in your power as I do while I'm alive to see to it that that will never ever happen again. Because as I said, never in the history of mankind such a scientific and systematic annihilation of people existed Unfortunately, we have genocide as we speak. You wrote, memory is a sacred ground, but it's haunted too. It's the place where my rage and guilt and grief go circling like hungry birds scavenging the same old bones. It's the place where I go searching for the answer to the unsearchable question, why did I survive? Later you wrote, it took me decades to discover that I could come, to, I could come at my life with a different question, not why did I survive, why did I live, but what is mine to do with the life that I'm given? What is mine to do with the life I've been given? The life you have been given has given us peace and hope and love. We are extremely thankful for you and for your love, and thank you so much for your time. I thank you for your brilliant I did too well because it's you matter. Just remember, I'll never be another you. So, God love you. Thank you.
I'll turn it back to Rabbi Levi. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Eager. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Eager, your passion, your love, your vibrancy, your message of hope, so much to unpack, so much to learn, so much to take home with us, your humor, your optimism, your positivity, you are an absolute source of inspiration. And you know, your last message, you said, looking at all of us towards the next generation, you said, quote, I'm counting on you. And Dr. Eager, I want you to know that we heard your words very loud and very clear. We're the younger generation and you can count on us. We're gonna do everything that we can, taking away from tonight the inspiration to anchor it into real actions of positivity, of elevated actions, of love, of kindness, of togetherness and you can count on us. We're gonna be walking away this evening doing everything we can to make this world a better and a brighter place. Thank you, Dr. Eager. May God Almighty bless you with many, many long, happy, young, and vibrant, healthy years till 120. And my dear friends, thank you all for coming this evening and being together. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are not only a brilliant... Go ahead. You're not only a brilliant rabbi, but I really like your tie. And I guess you have a lovely wife who bought you a lovely tie. Very handsome dude, too. Okay. I hope I'll see you someday. Thank you very much. Shalom. 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 Thank you. To conclude this night's evening, before we make our way back home, Dr. Eager, if you have a moment, because I really would love for you to hear this, uh, we have our county commissioner, uh, Mrs. Molly Cooper, who in honor of tonight's evening, we would like to anchor all of your inspiration that you've given us in marking an entire 24 hours in our county dedicated to education and sharing to anchor all of the inspiration. So my dear friends, as we conclude, let us put our hands together to welcome the commissioner of our county, uh, representing all of the other commissioners of our county, uh, Mrs. Molly Cooper. That's so kind. I would like to read to you a proclamation from the Board of Commissioners of Forsyth County, Georgia. Whereas a quality education is one of the significant foundations for the continuing success of our community. Forsyth County strives for the betterment of all of our citizens through an increased focus on education, sharing, and whereas through the providing the opportunities for an excellent education for all, especially children, we can create hope for a brighter, kinder, and more united and prosperous future. And whereas one of the leading global advocates for the advancement of education the Luba Victor Ribby, Rabbi Mankim Schneerson of Righteous Memory, <clears throat> stressed the importance of moral and ethic education and bedrock of community <clears throat> and hallmark of a healthy society, and strongly urged that education be reinforced by the inculcation of strong moral values, and whereas, in recognition of the Ribby's outstanding and lasting contribution toward improvement in world education, morality, and acts of kindness. He was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal the United States Congress established in eight, April 12, his birth date, as an education of our children. Now, therefore, and be it resolved, the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim Tuesday, April the 12th, 2022, as Education and Sharing Day and urges educators, volunteers, and residents to work together to recreate a better, brighter, more hopeful future for all. In testimony whereof, we have hereunto affixed the seal of the County of Forsyth, State of Georgia, the signature and members of the governing body thereof, given, to, <clears throat> given at coming Georgia on the 17th day of March, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Molly, and together let us pray. Molly, may God Almighty bless you with many, many healthy, strong years till 120. 
nothing less. <laughs> Dr. Eager, again, thank you so much for being together with us. A real honor and a real pleasure. Uh, may you continue to be so vibrant and strong and young for many, many long, healthy years. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been a true honor and a true pleasure to be all together this evening. Let us take all the inspiration, all of the ideas, all of the inspiration, and let's march out there and let's do everything we can to make this beautiful garden of a world that we live in a better and a brighter place. Good evening and thank you very much.